tell. I'm an old-fashioned teacher here. Okay, why, why is this not coming? It's, 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 oh, oh, it's loading. Okay, all right. Miss, miss impatient. <laughs> and so, there we go. Okay, so help me with basic chemistry. Let's do this hierarchical arrangement so that you understand where minerals fit in. So tell me the basic building blocks of matter. But atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And you're right, those are put together to make atoms of what? Atoms of the elements. And those can be combined to make molecules, correct, of compounds. When you combine these, it makes a molecule of some compound. Some of these, some of these are known as minerals. And in order to be a mineral, it has to have those five critical attributes, and I'm going to add a sixth one, because that's what you're fixing to learn to do. So tell me, quickly, the critical attributes of minerals. Solid. They must be a solid. Again, give me an answer, please. Inorganic. Inorganic. I'm trying to hurry so you can get to your lab work. Crystal or crystal-like. That means it would like to have formed one of those six basic mineral shapes, but maybe it didn't have enough room or slow enough cooling time. But it was attempting to, and that's why you'll see some crystal faces. Next, naturally occurring. They are natural things. We have four. Next. Definite chemical De structure. Yeah, chemical structure. Definite chemical composition or structure. And here's the last one. They can be ID'd by field the field tests. Mm -hmm. That's how we learn to name them. Okay, you're going to learn how to perform the field tests. And your ultimate goal will be to use a dichotomous key based upon your database and figure out what you have, right? So I have bridged the gap between, in your textbook, an introduction to minerals by starting out with the basic chemistry, understanding that they're going to fit right here. And guess what? Minerals are put together to make what? Rocks. rocks. But rocks in chemistry we would say that they are mixtures rocks are mixtures that's they retain their own original mineral identifiers they are not chemically bound together the individual minerals that make up a rock they are just mixtures of minerals okay all right so we'll come back and add on to this hierarchy later all right so you have on your tabletop a tray with two samples. I'm going to get this PowerPoint going, and you take those two samples and place them on any printed material. Any printed material. Lay them on it, and everybody be ready to discuss what you saw and to understand something brief about these two unusual minerals. This is called an engage. Thank <laughs> you. 
test on your minerals. And do you see this fiber optic cord right here? Mm -hmm. This little microscope I think is a must for elementary school classrooms. It is virtually indestructible. It is not expensive and that fiber optic cable right there you in a dark room you can it will gather enough light that you will be able to see. You don't have to have a light source of any kind. This does it. So, Ulexite has a fiber optic quality. It happens like this. The crystals of Ulexite have a long axis, and that long axis is all lined up perpendicular. Ulexite is an evaporite that happens in the northern parts of Texas, up in the Panhandle, where they have very shallow pan lakes. They're not deep at all. They are, are very shallow, and it gets hot, and the water evaporates, and it leaves behind beds of ulexite, known as TV stone. So when those, when the crystals are formed after evaporation of water, the long axis aligns themselves. And so when you look through the straws this way, you are seeing the image lifted to the top of the crystal. If you look at it this way, Will you see that? No. no. So everybody try it both directions so that you understand how the long axes are arranged. Are you saying that the optic on the bra is you like side? Is that what you're saying? No, I am not. I am saying that this is a fiber optic 
cable, a glass. Oh, glass. Okay. It is glass. And, and all the, the crystals are aligned to pick up light from everywhere in your room and, and allow you to see. So you're going to use some of these down in the lab in a minute, okay? All right, so if you hold the sample on its side so that the orientation of the crystals are perpendicular to the image, no image is transmitted. But if, if you turn it where the long axis is, is uh, perpendicular to the paper, then you will see that image reflected on the upper surface, okay? It's a pretty unusual mineral, do you agree? Yes. Now remember we have 4,000, some 4,000 minerals with more being discovered yearly. And, and so to find some with some unusual characteristics is really nice because you can so quickly know what you've got. But do you suppose that's going to be true with most minerals? No. no, it's not. But, all right, the other one, your other sample. So, what did you notice? Look, I skipped. Okay, what did you notice about it? You could see the image through all sides of it, but it was distorted. Like there was doubled, and, and it was at the bottom, not at the top. It is doubled, it is refracting, it is bending light and you are seeing two images of the printed material. This happens to be a crystal of, it's called Iceland Spar. It is a, a calcite crystal, but it has to be very, very clear for you to have a real nice double refracted image, okay? It's called Iceland Spar calcite. That's how you would have to order it, or sometimes you can find them in the gym and mineral shops. The TV stone is common in gem and mineral shops because younger children are really fascinated by it and, and it's, a, it's not an expensive mineral, uh, so you should be able to find them. If not, it's, they're in the catalogs, okay? All right, and so we are ready. Would you open your binder, please, to your mineral chart? It is page... 13, thank you dear for helping me. Page 13 in your handout is your chart. We are going to work through one mineral together and then you are on your own for approximately 40 to 50 minutes to complete all field tests on your 12 unknown minerals. I'm often asked if it's necessary to learn about all 12. And my answer is, there's nothing in here that wasn't placed there for a, a later on down the line reason, all right? So I have the common rock farming minerals in here, but I also have some special things that help with your understanding of minerals in other ways, okay? All right, so you're on page 13 of chart. Now then find page 7 because these are your cheat sheets. That's not a nice way to say it, but this is summarizing a tremendous amount of information about the field test. It tells you what equipment you have to have. It tells you how to use that equipment and how to record a, an observation that's meaningful, okay? So everybody found your cheat sheet, page 7, and it continues on through page 11, front and back. Everybody got the stuff you need now. Okay, you have two egg cartons, one for the two people on one side of the table and an egg carton for the two people on the other side of the table. Your samples are not numbered. The bottoms of your egg cartons have the number that corresponds to your data table and it will make it pretty easy for us to follow up if you keep your minerals in the right places. If you get them mixed up, I need to correct them for you, okay? I didn't put the stickers on it because we have to put them in water and so they come off. So I would have had to paint them, okay? All right, is everybody ready? Would you pick out mineral sample number one? When you open the box and switch the lid back, it starts in the upper left hand corner, number one through six, and the second row is 7 through 12. 
you and your partner make a habit of taking no more than two out at any given time, and you should have no trouble keeping them in order, okay? All right, mineral sample number one. Looking at your cheat sheet, it says, determine the color of sample number one. Very subjective, not a real reliable test for keying, but sometimes it's pretty important in a few cases. So look at sample number one. What color do you think it is? Let's have consensus, but I want to call on people. Okay, is everybody ready? You're looking at number one? So Martin, what color? Um, clear and cloudy. Clear and cloudy. We need a color though. <coughs> Colorless. Colorless. It has no color. It's clear. It's transparent. It is a little bit cloudy, some of them. But it would not have a color descriptor. So write in your blank. It is colorless. All right. Number two, uh, I'm sorry, at B test. Write on your paper that B is a test that will be performed in room 222. Two, two. So I'm going to start dismissing you as soon as you know how to do the test. And one table at a time is going to 222 two, two to take care of everything that's set up down there in stations. We don't have room to have stations in this classroom, okay? Normally you would have room in your lab, we would think. But anyway. You are going to go to 222, and there is a, a uh, little poster, bright fuchsia pink, I guess you'd call it, and it says luster test. You will see some baggies there with common everyday things to help mostly students, but I need you to, to look at those things in case you have a question. So take your pen or your pencil and underline in B, it says, you ask this question. When you pick up a mineral and you're doing the luster test, your question is, does it shine like a metal? Does everybody see that question under B, <coughs> luster? Does it shine like a metal? So you will answer either yes or no, but you don't write anything yet. So look at number one in your egg carton. Does it shine like metals shine? No. And your answer is no, all right? So if your answer is no, you write non-metallic, but leave room because you have to give it a non-metallic descriptor. So write non-metallic. And now let's figure out what non-metallic luster we need to put down there. Here are your choices. And each of these have a baggie down there of things that would fit the, these individual categories, okay, for children to compare their minerals uh, luster to. Number one is glassy. In your textbook, they call it vitreous. That would not be a word that you use with your children, but glassy is certainly a meaningful non-metallic luster. Pearly shines like a pearl. When you turn a pearl, you know how it's kind of iridescent? It will change colors, pink, yellow, green, bluish, and, and that's called a pearly, non-metallic luster. Silky, uh, there's a piece of silk cloth. Many wedding gowns are made of silk. I have a silk jewelry bag down there in the baggie for you to see what a silky shine, silky luster would be. Waxy or rosinous. Your textbook calls it rosinous, but to children, you would call it silky. And so I have down there some, uh, some. oh, I did that. I'm sorry. I'm on waxy wow. and rosinous. Yeah. Waxy and rosinous. I have a candle. I have some golf wax that's used for preserving uh, so that you can see a waxy look. There are several minerals that are typically excellent non-metallic lusters, waxy. And then earthy. Earthy just means dull. Any questions? What do you think you're going to write for your sample number one? Glassy. Good. Non-metallic and glassy. And so you next will be 
Whoops, I went the wrong way. Uh, the luster test, does it shine like a metal? If yes, record metallic. If no, write non-metallic. I'm going to tell you that this test is critical. Number one step on the dichotomous key is, is it metallic or non-metallic? So look close. There, you will have a magnifying glass in your little uh, plastic pouch, which each of you will get one of those plastic pouches when we're done. And it's a hardness kit, it's a street plate, and it's a magnifying glass for you, okay? And so you make sure it's not shining like a metal. Next. You are going to determine crystal shapes. Sandy might want to uh, add on to this because I think some of these terms are uh, slightly different in math. Yes, uh, remember right? And so you have a basket of the six mineral shapes. You also have a picture of it in your binder. It is page 17. And so if we are supposed to be starting in the most concrete way that we can, who is more concrete? This picture, a flat surface of three-dimensional objects, or to actually see the crystal shapes? More concrete to see the shapes. Okay, I want to warn you that you must consider two things when you look at these. They're clear for a reason. Because in geology, you have to consider the length of the axes. You have to compare the lengths of the internal axes. So you're looking at those green wires as they intersect the sides of the crystal. And you're comparing their lengths. And you're also comparing their angles of intersection. You are not looking at just the outside expression of a crystal shape. You must look at crystal, at the length of axes and the intersection of those axes, okay? All right, take your six crystals and set them on one of these sheets of paper so that we can come by and check to see that you have matched the crystal models to the crystal shapes in the picture. Now you have some descriptions right here. It tells you three equal axes all at 90 degree angles. So you look inside that crystal shape and see that. And Patty, after they do all of this, then I need to talk about it. Okay, you can go ahead anytime. Let's let them place them first.